Welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. We appreciate you spending some time with us. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi again, Alan. Hey, good morning, everybody. Beautiful weekend here, and... Uh, Glad Gorgeous to see you. Weekend. Gorgeous weekend in New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey's never been this nice. <laughs> well, what a week. And while the winner of the presidential race seems clear, we may not know about control of the U.S. Senate until the runoffs in Georgia take place in January. And lots of questions about what the changes in Washington may mean for autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicle services. You touch on that a little bit in, in the latest newsletter, in the lead article from Edmonds, headlined, Where Are Our Self-Driving Cars? Yeah, I, I guess um, we're going to go into a different world or b- back to the old world or something like that. Uh, maybe we've been in a different world for four years and, uh, and we'll go back to the normal world. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Um, there's probably going to be some change, but it seems as if, as has happened really with all other technologies, all other technologies have really come from the private sector. And, and, and in fact, they haven't really been motivated by government and by regulations before they got themselves started. And we're still at the very, very beginning I think one thing is clear going into the new administration is is that I I believe that we're getting a better definition of what it is that that folks are talking about. And in fact, instead of dealing with five, six levels of SAEs or whatever, that it's really breaking down into, into really two fronts. What goes in to help the driver uh, remain safe and, and helps the driver in conventional vehicles and what's out there for the provi- provision of mobility and the opportunity to provide mobility uh, affordably uh, at a very high quality. And, and so it is these two fronts that are really now coming out of this, which are really all fundamentally good uh, for both uh, society and the environment. And, and on, on the one front with respect to really improved and, and, and well-functioning uh, um, uh, driver assistance systems that, as I like to say, really, whenever we misbehave, it keeps us uh, from, uh, from really doing anything, anything bad and, and getting hurt. And so that's the really uh, important piece. And it seems as if these technologies are coming out into the marketplace. They're being embraced by NHTSA, by Euro and CAP, by consumer reports. And, and it's, it's, it's moving in that direction. Where the other piece that were, I guess I like to say, finally really started with Waymo really providing mobility as a service with driverless vehicles without attendance inside is now the opportunity to take that and really scale it, take it from just a little demonstration in, in suburban Phoenix um, to, as I like to say, the, the Trenton, New Jerseys of this world, uh, to the Mercer counties of this world, to the New Jerseys of this world, and really provide uh, enhanced mobility uh, for everybody. And, and I think it's up to industry to do that. It's not going to be government. It's not going to be the the new administration, but that new administration can oversee to, to provide at least, uh, if not incentives, to make sure they don't really stand in the way and to make sure that the, that technology is really focused on delivering mobility. And I like to say mobility to those who, who can benefit the most for, uh, from that mobility uh, earliest on the people that need it the most. And of course, that's why you and I and others have been working very hard through this pandemic and through the previous administration uh, to get this uh, started in Trenton, New Jersey and, and in places that could really use it 
as opposed to places that already have, uh, you know, people have enough cars to get around by themselves and don't really need it. One thing we, we do know, and it's not, I guess, directly related somewhat, um, is that uh, the incoming administration, Biden has been a proponent, a big proponent of electric vehicles, promising a, a big charger network and government getting involved there. So, yeah, yes. And even though he comes from Delaware, which, you know, isn't necessarily, uh, you know, sort of oriented towards electricity, one might think it's oriented a little bit towards the, the, the other energy source, but maybe, maybe not. Uh, but, um, uh, but yes, and, and the move to electricity and the electric vehicles is, seems to be substantive at this point. It's, it's not just Tesla. I think Tesla has made it chic. It, it, it's, made it, uh, it, it's made it the thing to have and, and so on. So, so that's really helped. But I think it's, it's getting to be that in fact, the, te the battery technology has gotten to a point that it is not infinitely expensive and in fact, may may have some durability and some and some cost aspects that that make that, that permit the technology to have enough range so that we get away from this range anxiety. We know it has the acceleration and the you know the macho in, in it uh, to do it, and and of course you know Elon's been pushing that. Uh, uh, with a cyber truck and whatever, so that everybody wants a redesign that. is coming of the cyber truck. Yeah, uh, it's like redesign. It doesn't it doesn't look like much of a redesign of a cyber <laughs> truck, but yeah, a redesign. And and I'm, you know, you have GM putting out a Hummer. I mean, cut it out. Really, we're back to the Hummer. But anyway, whatever. That's General Motors. Um, and and Ford's out there. Really, I guess serious about the uh, Ford F-150 uh, uh, EV version and, and really moving that. And I think we have another one of the articles we point out. I, I, I mean, we have Bentley right. out there saying, <laughs> you know, in 10 we'll, years. we'll get into that in a minute. But I guess <laughs> one, one of the other issues is the, the source of the electricity used for the sources used for charging. And uh, of course, the, the incoming administration is going to be uh, pushing alternative, cleaner energy sources. So maybe there'll be progress on, on that front. We'll see. Right, because, because for every conversion of every gallon of gasoline into a, a, a whatever kilowatts of electricity, that electricity has to come from someplace. It's marginal electricity. And we know where the marginal electricity comes from today. It comes from coal. Okay, so in other words, if we didn't need all the electricity we're using today, what would we close down? We would close down coal. We wouldn't close down the wind farms. We wouldn't close down the gas plants. We wouldn't close down the, uh, the solar arrays. We close down coal. So for every increment of electricity that we add on to the, our needs, our daily needs, uh, unless we, uh, you know, as we keep increasing the both the gas plants and the wind farms and the and the, the solar arrays really ends up coming from coal. I mean, hydro, I mean, look, every place water drops, we have a turbine, okay? We're not gonna get any more out of hydro. Um, we can get some more out of the sun. I think we can get some more out of wind. We certainly can get some more out of gas. Um, out of natural gas. Natural gas is cleaner than, than coal, not as good. It'd be nice if we went back to nuclear. I mean, you know, it has been more than, well, it's not more. It's coming on the 10th year since Fukushima. Maybe we've forgotten about Fukushima and could get back into, hey, uh, you know, uh, nuclear well, is I not think a Bill bad Gates option. is a proponent of some newer technology for nuclear plants, and uh, we can see where that leads. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's going to take Elon to do it. I don't know, but uh, but in a sense, I think uh, you know the French have been out there for some time with with some pretty decent uh, nuclear stuff. Um, you know, we we've gotten our stuff. We get, every once in a while, we 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 fall off the table or, or fall off the wagon with 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 nuclear. We get so far, then we, we then we make a mistake. Boom! It kills it for thirty years, and then. You know, and then uh, 
we put we put the the the, the pumps on the on the on the ocean side of the uh, of the plant so that when the tsunami comes it takes out the pumps oh my goodness whoa well we hopefully we've learned hopefully we've learned some lessons <laughs> all right yeah we keep like yeah you know uh, yes it's tough it's tough it is tough and hopefully we have learned some lessons well election day in california saw the passage of Proposition 22, a ballot measure backed by app-based gig companies like Uber and Lyft, DoorDash, Postmates, Instacart. In fact, they spent uh, over $200 million on the campaign for this, and it passed. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, it, it's a tough issue. It's a really tough issue. Yeah, I guess we should explain a little bit. It, it exempts these companies from labor law requirements related to health care, unemployment insurance, uh, other benefits. Yeah, and it, 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 it's really, it, it's tough because, you know, the, if you, one would like to have all employees have that, okay? But that makes things expensive. And it doesn't allow some people who want to do some things part time and just do it in some sense, feel like they're their own, their own boss and can take care of things themselves. It kind of keeps them out of there. And so, you know, it's nice to have the state take care of all of us, but, you know, some of us, uh, some people don't necessarily like that sort of political um, superposition on one's life. And so, you know, it's a tough one. One would certainly want each of these people to have a living wage and have the opportunity to if not have health care provided for them, provide their own health care. I mean, when, when an employer provides you health care, guess what? They're taking the money out of your pocket and sending it to United Health or Aetna or somebody like that. No. You know why Aetna and United and so on want to price those things so it's cheaper for an employee, to, uh, employer to do that than an individual to do that. I mean, that's a whole other issue. But it, you know, that's not coming for free. People are worried that's that's being taken out of their wages. Okay, I, you know, Princeton University doesn't give me health care. They charge me for it, damn it, I guess. I don't know, whatever. Uh, you know, so it's a tough issue. One does know is that at least what I believe in all this thing and what one does know with, with respect to all this is that if you're going to try to provide affordable mobility to folks, many people can't afford to pay somebody a living wage to do that for them, okay? So then they either do it for themselves, which is what most of us do, we drive ourselves, okay? We do it for ourselves. Or, you know, we're gonna have to get the gizmos and the, and the, and the code and all the other stuff to work. And, and then bring in Moore's Law, which, you know, thank goodness for Moore's Law, allowed those things to become exceedingly powerful and exceedingly cheap. And bring those things together to do it, do it for us, you know. Well, related to this. And, right. and, 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 and I guess, you know, you don't have to have health care for a chip <laughs> and a memory and some code and some gizmos, okay? I guess healthcare is antivirus have... software. Or something. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, uh, that, and that's expensive, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, no, all right, forget that, we need a new thing. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's what it is. Well, related, I was gonna say, Alan, uh, Uber failed to meet the investor revenue expectations in the third quarter, this past quarter with the uh, Gross bookings revenue dropping 10% from the period a year ago. 
they weren't helped, obviously, by, by COVID-19. But you point out, uh, as you're saying here, the problem is more fundamental. It's more fundamental revenue. Come on. They aren't paying those people a living wage. They aren't paying those people enough to buy, to buy health insurance. They aren't doing the fundamental things that they should do to the, for their drivers to, to, to be able to have a living wage. So they're nowhere near a revenue level that, that, that allows them to do that in the small where they are. And there's no opportunity to scale. For each additional driver that you need out there, you need health care or give them enough money to have health care and give them a living wage so they have enough money to buy food and housing and clothes and send their kids to Princeton. Okay. And so, you know, they need substantially more revenue if they're going to have that model in which they have a person driving one individual around. And even then, where are they going to find all the drivers you need to really scale this up? So well, driver, it, driverless, as you point out, is... It's the only way for them to go. Is the, otherwise, they have to... They can find drivers if they pay them enough. There are plenty of people who would want to drive if they got a living wage, if they got health care, if, if they got dental benefits, if they got vacation benefits. If they, if they were able to buy a nice place on, in, in May's Landing, there'd be plenty of drivers. Where does your revenue have to be if you're going to do that? Huh. I mean, it's nowhere near what Wall Street is asking them to do. Ask them to get enough revenue to be able to pay the back office people to write a little bit of software and maintain a little bit of software. No. Anyway, I don't know. So driverless, as you pointed out, is the only economic model that makes it's, sense. For it's, company. it's the only scalable thing that they have. With the infrastructure that they have, how do they scale means? How do you take your fixed costs and spread them over more? Okay. Without incurring incremental costs. That's what scale means. Okay. They are driverless. They're stuck. On that note, we'll continue in just a moment, but this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more info, head to MOTOETF.com. On the website, uh, check out the white paper. It's titled The Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab there. Great information there to help you make informed decisions about investing. You may know about ETFs. They're a good way to spread risk with your investments and focus even on a particular category of stocks. The site, once again, is MOTOETF.com. Alan, the Chinese autonomous vehicle startup Pony.ai now has a valuation of $5.3 billion, bringing in another $267 million in funding. And they've got lots of company too from China, don't they? Yeah, they, they have lots of company. There are other folks out there in China doing it. AutoX is another one and, and a number of others. And uh, yes, and they're tied in with Toyota and I guess that helps. And, um, you know, uh, but they still have a lot of work to do because they've got what they're developing is to go at, to address the market of driverless. I believe, I, did, I don't know, maybe, maybe in fact, they'll, you know, this is all to develop enough driver assistance technology for Toyota to, to take that, to put that through their particular um, uh, cars that they, they sell and will sell for the next th at least 30 years to individuals. And, you know, that's probably a reasonable business, whether it's a, that big of a business. Um, uh, I don't know. It's tight. I mean, others can do it. But, yeah, they're out there doing it. So it's another one. Um, the, 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 the entities haven't shaken out yet. There are still no number of them out there. And so Aurora's out there. And, and, and of course, the, the GM cruises and the Ford Ar Argos and so on, uh, they're all out there. So, yeah. A lot, a lot of partnerships taking place out there. They have to be partnerships, okay? 
they have to be partnerships. And in the, in the end, you'd need a vehicle manufacturer there because, because you aren't going to do your own vehicle. You know, Zooks wasn't able to do it, or Ors said that they couldn't. Um, Waymo, you know, said that's silly, uh, and so on. I mean, hey, uh, you know, if there's one thing the OEMs, the auto OEMs know how to do, they certainly know how to build a vehicle. They know how to build build a safe vehicle that's that at least um, uh, when it crashes, um, it, it, it protects the occupants. Uh, they know how to build them so that uh, they're uh, pretty much maintenance free uh, and they last, uh, they really do last a very long time. And it looks like EVs, if, if we can get the batteries to last, they're going to last whatever. I mean, and if we start building them out of aluminum, um, you know, they, they may be like airplanes, like DC3s are still around, I guess, <laughs> in the airplane world. Interesting. Well, they're talking like million mile batteries now. So we'll yeah, right. Them. I mean, that's yeah. at least that's what they're talking about. And I don't know. Do have they ever talked about a million mile uh, V8? I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> a lot of oil changes in ring jobs. <laughs> well, along those lines, I suppose Bentley has announced plans to go all electric within ten years, and they'll start with plug-in hybrids within the next year, they use the phrase sustainable luxury mobility. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, even though they're owned by Volkswagen and Germans, I, whatever, <laughs> what's going on here? You know, you can't even tell who, um, the lineage anymore, but yes, I mean, it's, it's rather interesting and, you know, not to have a V12 under the hood that just purrs. <laughs> purrs, you know, and your Bentley to do da da da, da, da uh, to have just a, uh, that's what you have a sound system for, you know, <laughs> and I guess uh, can Ferrari be far behind? I don't know, maybe. Uh, well, the, the, the electric vehicles certainly have the pickup for them. That's <laughs> that way. So, yeah, I'm, I mean that, that that's that's the really interesting thing of this of all of this. I guess for some time we've had you know we've had automatic transmission, so it's not the double clutching and, and the gear shifting that's that's been associated with these cars, uh, you know. And then and then what uh, uh, Ferrari put in the the paddle shifters anyway, and then you know, and so that piece of it. Uh, and, acceleration that you get out of these darn things and uh, yeah well, i have yet to be in a bentley or a ferrari but there's, there's, there's always hope so on the other end of the scale the chinese electric startup candy k-a-n-d-i has received approval to start selling its small k-27 electric cars in california the price after the incentives uh federal state etc Seven thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. Yeah, I think our friend Michael Sen has been talking about warning know, about it, right? Warning us about the uh, you know skateboards coming here and just being being a floodgate. Uh, you know, they can put it out there for eight grand. I mean, and the, the caveat here is uh, when I read about it, the range on these vehicles is a hundred miles. On a, on a charge, which, you know, that it sounds small compared to a Tesla or whatever, but for a lot of people getting to and from work, going for shopping, that's plenty, right? Fred, the, the you know, I, if you look at the distributions of miles traveled per day by vehicles, I think, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the median is, um, is, um, is 40 miles and you know with 60 miles you're up in the you know the 80 percentile or something like that so in a sense you know essentially for almost everybody and as a second third or fourth vehicle in, in, in a family I mean it's almost whatever and um, and 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 we are providing incentives here. Incentives for what? Okay. To whom? 
Well, the idea is to, it, the idea is to push the 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 EV technology, I suppose. I, I but then along comes this the, low cost maker, and I understand the reasons. Okay, but 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 if if you're going to push for an EV, it's a replacement of a of a of a gasoline car. Okay, in a sense, and it's I I don't know. I mean, one of the things that, that sort of somewhat has bothered me are things like high occupancy vehicle lanes, okay? So that if, if, if you have two people in the car, you get to use the HOV lane. But that assumes that you've left one vehicle back home that you would have otherwise been in two vehicles, the two of you that are traveling, going from wherever to wherever. So I bet if you stop, you know, every one of the cars using HOV lanes, permitted to use HOV lanes in California, what percentage of those cars, of those entities, two people in them, actually would have left a car at home? None? Hmm. 5%? Who are the two people? It's an Uber driver, somebody in the back seat. It's me chauffeuring my, my daughter to school. It's my wife and I going to dinner. None of those situations, we're leaving a car back home. Two cars wouldn't have gone down there. Not, not doing that. For the for majority of the folks that are using those things. So we've got to be careful of, of the way that we do incentives and make sure that the incentives that we do really lead to the achievement of things that we're trying to achieve with those incentives. So I don't know what we're doing, providing incentives to take a foreign made automobile brought here to the US and made it cheap to consume for whom? Don't know. Don't know. If, if, if it does provide great mobility, inexpensively affordable mobility to the folks who really need it most, I love it. Just wondering if in fact, that's what it's achieving. I guess time will tell with that. Well, we're gonna go from this little candy car, <laughs> so to speak, to... Well, as, I, as I said, in, 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 is it a Yugo? Is it a De Chavol? I mean, you know, those, <laughs> you know De Chavol was loved, in, at least in France. Uh, uh, Yugos, not so much. I don't know. Uh, I don't know where it's going to end up. But who, we'll, we'll see. Well, they're, they're tiny. On the other hand, Tesla has received an order from the Pride Group Enterprises for 150 Tesla semis. You remember a few years ago, they introduced the big semis that they were gonna build. The order may grow to 500 or so and production finally scheduled to start next year. So they, they really are gonna be in this business. They're getting the orders. I, I, it, 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 it looks like it. It looks like this isn't you know something fabricated. It's, it, looks, it looks like it is. And again, this is, we are at the very beginning. And to see it, you know, the, the claim is it's going to have 500 mile range, 700 mile range. Again, the kind of range that you need is is the kind of range that that a, that a tr those trucks do in a typical day with a driver. Drivers are only allowed to work 10 hours a day, give or take whatever the hours of service are. You know, so you know they can't really traverse much more than the five, 600 miles in a typical day. So in a sense, you know, it seems to be tuned to the market. And if you look at the distribution of trucking and the uh, and, uh, lengths of, of haul of class A trucks across the United States, sure, there are some that do the transcontinental. Sure, there are flowers that are brought up from, from Florida to the New York market. I mean, they, they use tandem drivers and they basically drive continuously. On, the, on those things. And sure, some trucking companies, you know, compete with FedEx at least westbound on Friday to send over land, you know, for Monday morning delivery, things that leave New York on, on, on Friday night. 
with tandem drivers. For those kinds of hauls, of course, these trucks aren't, aren't, aren't suited. But if you look again, if you look at the cumulative distribution of trip lengths for class A trucks, these trucks as designed really do hit a large part of the sweet spot for trucks. So in a sense, you know, might make, it might make some sense. And uh, Tesla is obviously convincing uh, some buyers that the return on investment is really worthwhile. Right. Well, our friend Brad Templeton has a, has a piece in Forbes that just headlined, self-driving cars can also self-design a whole new traffic code. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess uh, Brad and I have been talking about this for some time. The traffic, the rules of the road and the traffic codes have been developed under the assumption that there's a human in a loop, okay? And taking the human behavior part of it into the codes. That's why you see a sign that says speed limit. I mean, if you go to the Webster's Dictionary, it says limit is most that you can do. <laughs> thou shalt not violate it's i'm laughing like everybody else does when they're behind the wheel right it's it's the 11th commandment i mean you sh thou shalt not however you know they'll give us five four nine fourteen da, 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 who knows and, you know there's a distribution of drivers out there it's the same thing with stopping you know coming to complete stop at a stop sign now, why do you come at a complete stop at a song sign? So you have your time to turn your head this way and you turn your head that way to see if there's anybody coming. But hell, if you have gizmos on board, whether they're communicating or whatever, da, 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 who know it in a, in a fraction of a second as you're approaching and, you're, geez, and there's nobody coming, why stop? Why warm up the planet? I mean, that's just consuming energy. That's just against every environmental thing that you can think of. Go through it. Because you know, you don't have to, which takes time, but you have to be stopped. So all of a sudden you need a brand new way to look at these things. And, and you know, it's, we have a distribution of drivers, again, on the road. Different distribution of driver behaviors. Some like to go fast, some like to go slow, some like to stay in the left lane and block everybody. Some don't mind moving to the right, some don't pass on the right, some pass on the left. Da, 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 da. There's a whole distribution of us. We're not all the same. One of the things is though, with these things that will have code behind them, boy, they will, you know, they're all, they're all within a very narrow. But don't you need to have every vehicle or just about every vehicle on the, on the road automated for this to make any sense? No, because no, how do you know no. which, which vehicles well, are going to stop? And I don't know. You do. yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't know now. Yeah. You don't know now. Every time I go into a roundabout, a traffic circle, a rotary, whatever you want to call it, I'm wondering, do people really know what, who, has, who has priority here? I don't know. I don't know. Who has the yield? Even though there's a big yield sign there. Okay? You don't know. There are distributions of behaviors. So everybody doesn't need to be doing the same thing. But one does have to re realize that, a, that an entity out there that's on a computer has a certain behavior. I've argued for years, NHTSA never pays any attention to me. Of course they don't. That, that, that when you turn on your cruise control, there should be a light that goes on top of your car that indicates to everybody else around you that now you're this kind of driver. You're not the driver that tends to keep 
the, the, the depression of the accelerator pedal constant, which means you speed up and you slow down and you speed up and you slow down and you speed up and you slow down. This means, because that's the way a lot of people drive, okay? This means that in fact, you have a gizmo on board that's gonna keep you at whatever speed you have. You should announce that. You should let other people around you know that. And if you happen to have, have intelligent cruise control and use it, most of people that have intelligent cruise control don't use it. And in fact, you know, you're going to go constant speed until you're so far behind somebody else, and then it's going to just maintain your speed, and that's what you have on. Why, why not let other people around you know that? And you don't need to send a signal out to not tell us on our, our smartphones and we have to look at our smartphones, what's going on, just the light. And of course you'd let the other vehicles who do have the intelligence on board know that too, but they can see it just as well as we can see it. So let, you know, computer vision do it. So I still don't need the communications piece. But I think, you know, we have to, and and the folks that, that the computers that are out there driving, in some sense, have as much right to be out there doing whatever they're doing as you and I do. And they should be thought, oh, they're terrible drivers. Well, I don't know. I look at Fred, you're a terrible driver. I don't <laughs> see you again, whatever. You know, I mean, whatever. Anyway, uh, Brad points it out and we put it out there. And I think, you know, it's we've got to come to grips with this and coming to grips with it is not putting in random number of distributions out there so that, so that we get a, a, a distribution of behaviors out of the computer that looks like the distribution of our driving behaviors, because most of our driving behaviors are bad. They're wrong. Except for you. <laughs> that, that's yeah yours is bad mine are red. you got it love you fred <laughs> <laughs> well finally alan the the fourth annual princeton smart driving cars summit still in the planning stages and of course with the pandemic uh, lots of revisions and looking at what makes sense and you, you're making some progress on that front Yes, I mean, we've, uh, we've danced around this and we've postponed it and we've hoped for, you know, a resolution of this, uh, this issue so that we could all get together and da 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 That isn't going to happen in this calendar year, okay? So we are going to do it on the virtual, even though we would all love to get together. And, you know, that's the real benefit of having this is that when all of us get together and and discuss this in, 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 a, in a friendly uh, way, uh, in a nice social way, but that's not gonna happen. So at this, we, we are now considering, in the past we've had it for two and a half days because the first night at my house with a, with a social gathering and then we, go, we then go on campus and, and do uh, two days of, uh, of um, in-depth technical uh, discussions and the, the objective of the of the summits have been not just to present information as we're seeing now during the pandemic presenting information i mean go look it up go watch a video i mean you know whatever the the real value uh, out of all of these is is the, the network the interaction the participation with the audience so what we're what we're really trying to do with the, with the summit is to maximize the amount of participation that not only the the producers the moderators the the um, uh, the, the panelists provide but also the audience. So the real trick that we're trying to accomplish out of there is to get participation and and input from the audience that's tough in this in this environment but i think the way that we think that we're going to try to do it is instead of having this over two and a half days in which it's kind of tough 
being at home and staying focused on one thing on, I mean, you, you can't do it. If, if we make you come to Princeton and we're feeding you and we're having, giving you some, al- some, some adult beverages along the way, I mean, you're, you're fine and partake in all that and, and, and you'll be there. Uh, you know, being at home, it's kind of tough. So what we've decided to do is, is really spread this out over time and basically do it in hour and a half chunks once a week for something like 10 to 15 weeks. So we will start on December 10th, Thursday, and we will do the first one, which I will set the sage for the the ensuing weeks. And then we will focus on the two main topics here of the the automation. On the one hand, uh, the piece having to do with, with driver assistance and the second piece having the, to do with the provision of affordable mobility to folks who could benefit from it most, most improve the quality of their quality of life. And those are the two main thrusts that we'll take to take us through the technology, through the, through the regulation, uh, through the, the decision making that has to take place, especially on this second one. to to say, my goodness, I'm going to actually go out there and do this in a a sense uh, to to actually be affordable and to do it and to take the driver out of that. And what does that take? And and where should that be? And how how are you safe enough to take that risk? And all those kinds of issues, as well as the classic issues. Uh, We'll look at the incoming administration at one point and and look to try to move this along with the audience in which we will attempt to to garner as much contribution from the audience as is coming from this side of of the of the of the zoom environment and um, and that's going to end up being a uh, somewhat of a challenge um you know we'll get we'll we'll offer people you know like polo shirts and fleeces or something like that or hats I don't know whatever whatever we can offer them you know <laughs> I've been trying to suggest that uh, you know maybe we can we can have DoorDash you know uh, send lunch <laughs> you know uh, then when you look at it I mean that that is <sighs> environmentally that's pretty expensive environmental thing to to deliver I mean uh, but no comments on that. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to try to make it work. And so we'll work with the audience. If anybody uh, has suggestions that they would like to, uh, to make to us in trying to make this as interactive as possible, as much contribution from the audience as possible, um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, my email's on there, alankk at princeton.edu. Um, you can, you can said, write me at fishkin at textination.com. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to start the first one December 10th. We'll do uh, another one on December 17th. And then we'll take a break for the holidays and come back in the middle of January and go through the middle of March. And it will be, you know, in some sense, almost like a, like a course. Uh, but we don't want it to be like a course. This is not going to be lectures to you where you sit there and, you know, drone out in, in the audience. Uh, we want to encourage and, and induce uh, contribution and, uh, and discussion with the audience because everybody who's listening is, is, is as much of an expert as everybody else who's doing the presentation. So, Well, people should go to uh, smartdrivingcar.com to stay abreast of what the latest developments are there. We want to thank our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO. More information is available at MOTOETF.com. You can find us at smartdrivingcar.com, also on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. Amazon Music carries us too now. You can ask your smart speaker to play us. You can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. 
thanks so much for taking the time to listen or watch. And please continue to stay safe. Yes, and thank you. And uh, it's wonderful here in Jersey. It's amazing. You know? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs>